So yeah, we'll be brief here, and um, and all of us will be around for questions um, during the lunch uh, time and after and throughout the whole conference. Um, if you want to get involved more globally, I know you're uh, compassionate about that sometimes practices and family uh, matters and what you have here domestically get in the way of that, but there is ways of getting involved. So I'm just going to very briefly go over a concept of emergency medicine and how it impacts and works with oncology and hematology and a concept that could be brought worldwide. So as you know, um, without just reading you these slides, there, uh, patients don't have oncologic and hematologic emergencies nine to five. It's a 24-7 phenomena. Um, we uh, see a lot of patients in our emergency department in Boston because we're affiliated with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And these tend to be the patients with the highest uh, critical care. Uh, they're the most fragile patients and yet Traditionally, they get ushered in the waiting room with all the other patients and then hopefully seeing in a, in a quick fashion. But they require rapid diagnostics, and as Benet referred to in his talk, they need uh, treatment and care. And I know in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, like the rest of the country, there's a huge opioid epidemic. So I've seen opioids now withheld on cancer victims that really need uh, pain management. Um, they're also very complicated with their social and family histories, as you know, and there is a real population shift now towards more geriatric and seniors. So we're looking at um, uh, emergency department oncology unit at Brigham and Women's Health, and again, we're, we're affiliated with Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Harvard, and um, we're in the middle of redesigning our entire ED to make it uh, twice as large. And with the number of cancer victims we see in a given shift, 20% of the patients I see have an acute cancer hematologic oncology uh, crisis. And 30% have a diagnosis of cancer somewhere in their past history and may be presenting with other things. So with that, we thought with the redesign, we should make a unit just for oncology patients. And when they come into our ED, they will be ushered uh, right back. Uh, they will not have to get in the fray of uh, what traditional emergency departments are, uh, non-private rooms, curtains. Um, and as you know, it's like a Petri dish in most <laughs> emergency departments. And the nosocomial infections that these immunocompromised patients may uh, run into is really a concern and of course we want to educate and and form curriculum so again without reading these slides um, really we're looking at what patients may go into blast crisis which ones may have sepsis pulmonary embolism and detecting it early as opposed to reacting to it when they present that way and we're also looking at the social network and their family network and involving their families and we want to stream them through. Uh, one thing that's very unique about our institution, we have attending to attending conversation with our oncologist and hematologist. I talk to attendings at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute every shift. They know their patients very well. We call them early in the treatment course so we're not over-treating them, we're not under-treating them, and we're getting targeted focus management where it used to be that every patient presenting to the ED just automatically got admitted. Clearly, that may not be the best interest of the patient, and as you know uh, better than I, caring for these patients, it's probably the last place they want to be. Uh, so we look at other ways of getting them through with medical record numbers and, again, uh, communicating directly with their uh, physicians and oncologists for a point of care. And we also recognize very quickly that the hospital may not be the best place for them. So there are other options. There's hospice care, uh, there's home care, and, and clearly there's observation units as well. And so we've developed this that patients who come in to our oncology ED may stay, they may go home, but usually what happens most often is that they get transitioned into an observation unit where they're met by the oncology hematology team to decide what is 
best for them. And this is a very unique uh, system, and we're finding that it's uh, already quite effective in the redesign as it's being instituted. And we're also, uh, again, besides the education piece, we're uh, uh, making sure that we detect cancer early. Damiano's really been preaching to me since I've known him. Cancer screening in the ED is the way to go. We're starting to initiate that and, again, identify those patients that may have complications early in the course rather than when they're critically ill. So again, we see a high volume of cancer victims in our ED, uh, 20 to 30 percent. So we're developing quite a database uh, that will be uh, valuable for looking at protocols that can be used nationally and internationally. And with that, there's research, there's nanotechnology, there's looking at chemotherapeutic regimens, side effects, clinical trials, and again, anticipating uh, complications from these uh, trials. And, and I know in the melanoma talk, there was a lot of references to immunotherapy. We're starting to see breakthroughs in that as well. Other cutting edge things, we're looking at uh, antidote therapy for some of the chemotherapeutic agents, 5-FU, methotrexate come to mind, um, as well as uh, streamlining uh, the social aspect and other research agendas. So the global cancer quiz, there's supposed to be a, a question for every uh, lecture, I guess, presentation. See if you are paying attention. Worldwide, what percent of patients who need palliative care receive it? This was uh, referred to in Benet's talk. 15%, correct, Damiano. And uh, what percentage of cancer deaths worldwide occur in low to middle income countries? Damiano referred to this like his second slide. 70%, very good. And then uh, this is a review of that. If you, if you have cancer in a low to middle income country, the incidence almost equals the mortality, which is tragic. So they're being diagnosed, uh, but oftentimes too late or they don't have the resources for it. So again, I, I just want to throw it back at the great work of the Benet Terra Foundation of what they're doing to advocate. And I know, Benet, your first word in your new motto is innovate, but I, I really think the strength of the foundation has been advocating for patients less fortunate. So I'm biased, but I think that should go first. Uh, educating, again, uh, those in country and the train-to-trainer model, as both Damiano and Benet have really, uh, really done throughout their whole careers and then innovating with telemedicine, palliative care, as you can see. And then why do I bring up the, the ED in Boston? Why does that have anything to do with globally? I really feel, and I'm biased in this and we're just starting to scratch the surface, this could be a model internationally in low to middle income countries. There's no reasons large mega cities with huge emergency departments shouldn't have separate areas for oncologic victims and getting them out of the waiting rooms, getting them into areas where they can be cared for quickly, maybe not admitted, and having um, the whole team meet them. It's a cost-effective ways where they may not have immunotherapy, they may not have the Lantus antidotes and chemotherapeutic regimens, but you heard what Benet said, uh, the cost of morphine for pain control, the cost of some of these chemotherapeutic drugs are actually quite uh, reasonable and we should be doing this. Uh, we're looking in India, in Bangalore of doing this, in Kathmandu, uh, there's Nigeria with the great work Damiano's doing in sickle cell, Cuba is another one, and of course Ukraine. So working on ED onc units globally may be a very cost effective means of increasing survival rate and really paying attention to these patients who are the sickest in the department quite often. Here are some references, I won't read them all to you, but a couple of them. An elephant in the emergency department, a symptom of disparities in cancer care. And another one here, uh, the low value practices in oncology contributed to financial toxicity. So many of these patients in these poor countries, they don't know any better. They will literally spend a six month to a year's salary to care for one of their family members with an unproven regimen. And they lose everything, their property, they go bankrupt, and this needs to stop. We really need to intervene and uh, help out these countries, and I think we have the means to do it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, thanks. I uh, want to make sure you have time for lunch and questions. 
uh, particularly for Damiano Benet, and because of the time constraints, see them throughout the conference. They're great uh, means of networking globally if you're interested in doing that and extending your practice. It doesn't have to be two years of your time. It could be two weeks, four weeks out of the year where you really devote yourself to one area of need uh, globally. Uh, it's needed. So thank you very much.